today as we come to the table. His wrath will be poured on the entire earth during that time. Now, again, how do I know the church is gone? As I said, we're not appointed to that. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, Mark, what about uh, throughout history? Christians have been persecuted. They've been put to death. And bad things have happened throughout uh, church history. What about that? There's a big difference between the wrath of man, the wrath of Satan, and the wrath of God. Big difference. The church has always had to endure the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan. The church has never endured the wrath of God, nor will it. As I said, God will not have a battered bride. Many people as they grow up have to deal with being picked on or even attacked by other children. If the attacks became too bad, their father would step in and remove them from the situation, after which the others would be punished in some way. You may have been one of those people who faced attacks from others, but never your father. Thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark illustrates how even though the church has suffered the wrath of people and even Satan, we will not experience the wrath of God. If you're a Christian, you may be persecuted and attacked by people all around, even the devil. Be assured, you will never face the wrath of God that they will experience. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Revelation chapter 4 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Chapter 4, and remember, if you remember how Revelation is broke up, uh, broken up, broken up into three different segments. And actually, from chapter 4 on is segment number 3. Now, what do I mean segment number 3? Well, uh, the angel of the Lord, rather the Lord, told John, he said, write the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. That was the instruction he gave to John. Well, we see the things that were in verse, or rather, chapter 1. That is, Jesus has died and resurrected and now seated in the heavens and is ruler over all in the heavens. So John wrote down the things that, that were. And then John came to the things that are. And that was, in John's day, the seven churches. Uh, what was happening in the churches? The church's activity on the earth. And we talked about the fact that not only what the church literally was doing in that day, but the fact that the church was a picture of, of church history throughout world history. So really we got a capsule, encapsulation of the entire history of the church wrapped up in all seven churches as well as a literal speaking to the churches in that. And that was the things that are. So really kind of covered everything until Jesus comes back. And now we come to section number three, the things that will be. And that's where we start in Revelation chapter four. And notice he says in verse one, after these things... I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. I believe this is the place in Revelation where the rapture of the church takes place. Now, I believe it for a number of reasons. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about here in verse 1. First of all, after these things, metatauta in the language, and what that means is, is once everything else is done, moving on to a new segment. It's a whole, it's a break in the language to something that is brand new, brand new and being introduced as though it was not there. So he's saying, hey, we're starting something brand new right here, and, and it's in this verse, and he says he looked up, and a door standing open in heaven. Jesus said, I am the door. And then he says he heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Now, it wasn't a trumpet, but a voice that sounded like a trumpet. That is loud and catching your attention, just boom, you know, something that really can get your attention good. And all of a sudden, that voice that sounded like a trumpet said, come up here. And the come up here means he was caught up to heaven. He was snatched up or pulled up to heaven. And the voice said, I'll show you things that will happen or that will take place after this. Now, that should be ringing some bells already for some of you. 
The rapture is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as the Lord will descend from heaven with the shout of an archangel, the voice of a trumpet. So, so his voice will sound like a trumpet. Whether or not there'll be a real trumpet that blasts, we'll find out. But his voice will sound like a trumpet. And here we see again a voice sounding like a trumpet. And the Bible says we will be caught up, the word harpazo, in the Latin it's translated rapturo or rapture, where we get the word rapture for it. But literally in the language harpazo, which means caught up. And it says, we'll be caught up to be with the Lord and we'll be with him forever. This is the same picture, I believe, and the similarities are quite stark here. As he calls John to come up to the door, Jesus Christ, to come up there and pulls him up. And now after this, John begins to see these visions of heaven. Now, there are several things that also are very intriguing about this. Why I believe this is the rapture. This will be the last time you're going to hear about the church until we get to the very end of Revelation. Revelation 1, 2, and 3 are filled with the church. And all messianic terms. As a matter of fact, chapters 2 and 3 are nothing but the church. The seven churches of Revelation. And suddenly and mysteriously, starting in chapter 4, the church disappears from the pages of Revelation. And now from this point on, Jesus will only be spoken of in messianic terms in the original language. And I believe the Holy Spirit is giving us a very clear picture of what's happening here. That is, at this point... The church is gone, and now God is going to begin to deal with the nation of Israel in the final seven years before his second coming. And that's why the whole time from this point on, the church is not mentioned, and we'll be looking at messianic terminology through the Jewish eyes, uh, Jewish eyeset. How's that for a, a new word? The Jewish eyeset. I knew it was wrong before I said it, but you get, you get what I... Makes sense, though, right? See, you're following me. Anyway, um, through the Jewish eyes and mindset. So kind of that combination there. Um, we'll see the church show up once again and the terminology of the Messiah again in the church form when we get to the Lord coming back in the second coming and really there in Revelation 22 when we rule and reign with him. So that is another reason I believe the Holy Spirit is showing us very clearly this is the place where the rapture takes place. Now this would make sense and why? I want to answer two things. Are there any evidence in the Bible for the rapture and when will the, when will the rapture take place? And we'll talk about the different viewpoints, but Again, this is very uh, important here to me because we see that when the church disappears from the pages of the scripture, now begins the final seven years that God deals with the nation of Israel, which goes into the great tribulation. And why is it I believe the church will be gone as God deals with Israel in the great tribulation? Because God has promised Israel in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, seven more prophetic years that he has not yet given them. And God has also said that at the middle point of that seven years, he's going to pour out his wrath and judge the entire world for their rebellion against his son, Jesus Christ. So, number one, God will not be dealing with the church. He'll be dealing with the nation of Israel, although some will be saved after the rapture during that final seven-year period. But also, I know that we won't be here during the Great Tribulation because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, that we, the believer, are not appointed to wrath. And the Bible specifically says that the last three and a half years on this planet before the second coming will be not only the wrath of God, but the wrath of God on the entire world. There will be one spot that will be protected. It will be Petra. So for those of you that went with us last year to Petra, you were in the one place on the earth that will be protected during the great tribulation. And that is because the Jews that God has kept his promise to to fulfill his final seven years, those who get saved and are wise enough to flee will go to Petra. God will supernaturally protect them, and yet his wrath will be poured on the entire earth during that time. Now, again, how do I know the church is gone? As I said, we're not appointed to that. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Mark, what about uh, throughout history? Christians have been persecuted. They've been put to death. And bad things have happened throughout uh, church history. What about that? There's a big difference between the wrath of man, the wrath of Satan, and the wrath of God. Big difference. The church has always had to endure the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan. The church has never endured the wrath of God, nor will it. As I said, God will not have a battered bride. He is not a wife beater, and the church will be gone during that time that God will be pummeling the earth in this great tribulation. Now, there are three main viewpoints of the, the rapture. And let me say, before I even get into this, the teaching of the rapture, I believe, very, is very clear in Scripture, and I believe even the position that I take, or I wouldn't take it. Um, however, it's not something we divide over as Christians. Does everybody understand that? There are three main positions, pre-rapture, mid-trib, and post-trib. And I'll explain them in just a moment. But regardless of where you stand on that, 
Calvary Chapel stands very firmly in pre-trib. I stand very firmly in pre-trib, and I'll give you a few reasons on that. And I'm in the midst of writing a little booklet that I'll have for sale in the bookstore for you guys here in a few months where you can have, an, have some documentation following it from the Old Testament all the way through to the New as a good reference handbook for you guys. But why do I believe that? Do I believe that because Calvary Chapel believes it? No. Do I believe that because some of the greatest teachers believe it? No. Uh, there are some great teachers that believe other things. I believe it because I have been convinced by the Word of God that that's where it is. And what the pre-tribulation says is, is that before this final seven years that God has promised to the nation of Israel that we find in Daniel chapter 9, before that begins, um, I believe the church is taken out of here um, for a lot of reasons. Let me give you a few. First of all, some Old Testament pictures. A lot of people say that the rapture is a new teaching. Well, then tell that to those who, uh, who very clearly the whole Holy Spirit teaching it in the Old Testament. The very first rapture we see in the Bible, there's already been a rapture, actually, actually, and I'll get my mouth working right in a minute. Enoch. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was translated. What that means is he was translated from his earthly body to his heavenly body just like that. That's what it means as it talks about Enoch walking with God in the Old Testament there in Genesis. Now you might say, well, Mark, what do you mean that is a picture of the rapture? Unless you understand the chronology of how things happen in the Bible, it won't make sense. But once you begin to see the chronology, it begins to fall in place. Because right after Enoch was raptured came the flood. Now, the only righteous left on the earth besides Enoch was the family of Noah. God took Enoch to heaven. Noah and his family went in the ark seven days prior to the earth being flooded. I believe it's a picture of the rapture seven years before the final judgment of the Lord when he comes back in his glory to establish his throne. When you get to Genesis 22, you see Abraham going up on the mount to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And you see them both go up there. And the whole thing, you know that God intervenes. He doesn't sacrifice Isaac because God says that he will be the sacrifice. And we know it's a picture of Christ being sacrificed on Mount Moriah, which is where he was. And very interestingly, but really very glaringly, I mean, to me, it just, it really is glaring that we know that Isaac came back down the mountain with Abraham. We know that. But the Bible just says, and Abraham came back and returned to go home. The Holy Spirit completely leaves any mention of Isaac out of the picture at all. But we know he was there. Now, why would the Holy Spirit do that? I believe it's a picture of the rapture of the church and the reuniting of the bride. When is the next time you see Isaac in the pages of Scripture? When he's being united with his bride in the field. He disappears completely until suddenly he shows up again on the pages of Scripture when he's there united with his bride. Now, there's more in Isaiah. We don't have time, but I'll jump on to the New Testament. Of course, we have 1 Thessalonians, where we see the Lord descending from heaven with a shout. Uh, those who are alive and remain will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. And um, we will forever be with the Lord at that point. And we know that this is some, a surprise because the Lord said over and over that he's coming like a thief in the night. The Lord said over and over, watch, watch, watch. You know, that means you're not going to know when it is, so watch. He said, no one knows the day or the hour. And we see the rapture of the church. And I think we're going to see it also when we get to chapter 5. Um, we'll talk about that when we get there, a picture of the, the church in heaven. But this is why I very firmly believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. But the greatest reason, probably for me, the thing that really sealed it, and all my years of study and searching it, and all these different people saying mid-trib, post-trib, what was it? I wanted to know for myself. I didn't want to go just because this guy taught it or that church said it. I wanted to know for myself. And the thing that really sealed the deal for me is something very interesting. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 9 that when this final seven years begins for the Lord, it's going to be exactly... 2,520 days until the second coming. In other words, what he says in Daniel is, when you see the Antichrist sign a treaty between Israel and all their surrounding neighbors, this world ruler, whoever he is, if you see a world ruler sign a treaty with the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations, there's a clue. You can start your stopwatch right then, and it will be exactly 2,520 days until the second coming of the Messiah. It lays that out very clearly in, uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 9. And again, we don't have time to go through that, but if you want to, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, we have that online at pastormarkkirk.com or go to our website or grab a CD or do whatever you want. You can find it a lot of places. So when I found that out, it became very interesting to me because I realized what Jesus was saying when he said no one would know the day or the hour, he was most certainly not talking about the second coming. Because whoever is here 
when that treaty is signed and knows the Bible, they'll be able to tell the exact day of the second coming. So when I realized the exact day of the second coming was predictable to the day, once that treaty signed, it's not now, but once that treaty signed, then I realized the Lord had to be talking about the rapture when he said, no one knows the day or the hour, and I'm coming suddenly like a thief, because certainly if you're counting the days down, he wouldn't come like a thief. If you're counting the days down, it wouldn't be sudden. Everybody would know he's coming. It'd just be three more days, two more days, one more day, and boom, there he'd be, right? So he's specifically speaking about the rapture when he says, no one will know the day or the hour. Now, if I'm here, the mid-trib teaches, there's the pre-trib, and I'll get back to this. The mid-trib teaches that at the very middle of the Great Tribulation, the Lord will come back. That would be 1,260 days in. Got a total of 2,520, 1,260 in. By the way, the Lord uses 360-day years prophetically from Genesis all the way through. Uh, a lot of different theologians uh, will argue about why that is, but that's called expositional constancy. So if you go back and count your days, you need to use a 360-day year. But be that as it may, the bottom line is 1,260 days in, the three-and-a-half-year point, in that, uh, they say is when the mid-trib will take place. Problem, I can predict the day. Since I know it's exactly 2,520 days when that treaty signed, I can count down 1,260 days and say, he's coming today, but he said, no one will know the day or the hour. I know, because I know Daniel, and I know Revelation. So to me, that X is out mid-trib. It's impossible, it's biblically impossible. So the next one is post-tribulation. Well, all I have to do, they suppose tribulation teaches he's coming at the very end. At the second coming, we go up and come right back down, kind of like an elevator effect. We go up, and I'm not making fun of it, but that's, we just go up and come right back down. Problem, at the very signing of that treaty, excuse me, yes, you in the back, troublemaker again, yeah, it's me. He's coming back in 2,520 days. You don't know that. Yes, I do. I can show you from Daniel and Revelation. So I could literally predict mid-trib. I could literally predict post-trib. The only one that can be a surprise, the only one that can be a thief in the night is pre-tribulation. That's why I firmly stand in the pre-tribulation camp. Now, with that said, do I have brothers that stand mid-trib and post-trib? Yep. Do I love them? Yep. Am I going to fight with them and divide over this? Nope. Because this is a non-essential. It's fun to know. But it's a non-essential. This is not a salvation issue. No matter what you believe on the rapture, it doesn't affect your salvation. It just makes you more prepared for what's coming. So he says, come up here, and I'll show you things that must take place after this. So I think this is when John and the rest of the church will be there in heaven. And now John begins to see this vision. He says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So he's seeing the Father and Jesus here. And he who sat on the throne was like Jasper and a sardius stone, in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now this is interesting because he says around the throne is this rainbow, which is interesting that Satan would try to use the rainbow for bad symbols, if you know what I mean. The rainbow was meant to be a symbol of God's promise that he would never judge the earth again by water, but not that God wouldn't judge the earth again by fire, which he will. But this is an interesting rainbow around the throne. It's going to be very, very colorful and, and beautiful and bright around the throne. But notice it says this rainbow will be in appearance like an emerald. An emerald is a really nice green color. It'll be a beautiful emerald color that's around the throne like a rainbow. Now, whether there'll be other colors mixed in, of course, we see here the jasper and sardius. One is like a diamond type look. But it's going to be a beautiful color emanating from the throne of God, this emerald green. We see that in other visions. We see it in Ezekiel as well. So if you like colors, you're going to love heaven. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, who are these 24 elders? Nobody really knows for sure. I think the best explanation I've ever heard is that it's probably um, the 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament and the 12 uh, apostles from the New. Now, that just might happen to be because there's 12 and 12, and it makes 24. But if so, that's very interesting, because if this is indeed 
uh, the 12 representing the Old Testament saints and the 12 apostles representing the New Testament saints, kind of sitting in that uh, place of, of, of authority and, and recognition there in heaven. If it is that, it's interesting because John would have been one of them. John was one of the apostles. So John, if this is true, was there in the vision seeing himself sitting there going, whoa, that's me. Now, I don't know whether it is or not, but we do know that the Lord has chosen certain places for certain people to sit because remember when James and John said, you know, his mom said, can they sit, my son sit on the left and the right of you when you come into the kingdom? He said, that's for the father to decide. He's already decided who's going to be sitting where. And so, um, who knows? Possibly, we know they're definitely believers are clothed in white robes and they've got crowns of gold in their head. The Bible says it will be, it will be given crowns. So it represents the church. It represents the followers of God at the least. And so we have these crowns of gold and we're going to be included in this representation. We'll see them in a moment casting those crowns to the Lord as we're going to do as well. And it says, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Wow, it's going to be a loud place. Now you'll have a new body with ears that can handle it good. But can you imagine God's lightning? And God's thunder and the voices of the angels and the multitudes, hundreds, you know, millions of people there, you know, shouting and praising God. You know, if you don't like loud worship, you won't like heaven because it's going to be there. And there's going to be beauty all around it as well. So it's going to be a very colorful and, and loud place, but exciting. And it says, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are of the seven spirits of God. Now, we've seen the seven spirits of God before back in Isaiah. It basically shows the completeness of God. Seven in Scripture is the number of completion. And so basically it's saying the complete, full spirit of God, all God's facets, all his avenues, everything is complete in him in that fullness there, in the seven spirits of God that are around the throne. So God in his fullness and the fullness of his spirit. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Imagine how beautiful that is. You know, it's interesting when you think about this sea of glass, it would have been huge with all of us standing on it. We're going to see that we're all standing on it there. Notice in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So you have this big sea of glass, and we're going to see in a moment we're on the sea of glass. We're casting our, our at least casting our crowns there on the sea of glass to the Lord like crystal. And again, if you've ever seen light go through crystal, you know, it becomes like a prism. And you have all these beautiful colors and all this radiant light that comes through it. And can you imagine this crystal throne, I mean this throne and this crystal sea and, and all the lights emanating and all the excitement and all the beautiful colors and all. And there we are. It's going to be an overwhelming scene in heaven when we see this. This is what we're going to see. So you're getting a glimpse of it, although you can only imagine what it's really going to look like. And notice it says, around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Now, Hollywood comes up with some pretty crazy creatures. You know, some of these beings they come up with in their special effects, listen, they've got nothing on God. We're going to see these angels have four faces, some of them, and they've got eyes in front and eyes in back. The book of Revelation is a good reminder that things happening here on earth have an expiration date. There isn't an indefinite amount of time for evil to persist. If you're honest, you'd likely admit it would be nice to have a reset, a clean slate, a new world of sorts. Well, did you know that Jesus is bringing this about sometime in the future? What a thing to look forward to. Like any blockbuster, end-of-the-world movie, there's always some culmination between good and evil. But guess what? The things mentioned in Revelation will happen. They're not just some made-up plot line to make lots of money at the box office. So keep grounded in the book of Revelation as we uncover more and more of God's heart behind all that will occur. Pastor Mark will continue next time in the book of Revelation. But before we go, we'd like you to know about a way that you can join us this weekend. At Calvary Knoxville, we have several services. We meet on Saturdays at 6 p.m. and Sundays at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. We also have a midweek service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. Come join us and be part of what's going on here. Find out more at thewaymedia.net. You can also give our church office a call at 865-609-1385. Again, that phone number is 865-609-1385.
Thanks for being a part of our listening audience. If you'd like to hear these messages whenever you'd like, download the Way Media app. We hope you'll continue with us next time in the book of Revelation, here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.